Welcome to Intergenerational Politics, a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Shi, a freshman at UCLA, the youngest elected delegate for Joe Biden, and also one of the co-hosts of this podcast. I'm Jill Weinbanks, his co-host, and also the wearer of Jill's pins and the author of The Watergate Girl. Today's pins are a vote Georgia. It's Georgia peaches and a vote. So it seemed appropriate for our guest today. In state legislatures across the country, Republicans are introducing bills that will suppress the votes of minority communities at the ballot box. The degree to which this is happening is unprecedented. In fact, as of February 19th, 2021, the Brennan Center reported that there have been more than 250 bills designed to restrict voting by limiting mail-in ballots, drop boxes, early voting, voting hours, and purging voter lists. We have a guest today who is on the front lines of protecting democracy and voting rights, Mark Elias. Mark is the chair of Perkins Coie's political law group and the founder of Democracy Docket, an organization that focuses on detecting, highlighting, and combating suppressive voting laws. He and his organization led the court battles against the GOP's suppressive tactics during the 2020 election and in combating the GOP's tactics now to overturn the results of the election on unsubstantiated claims of widespread election fraud with a near 100% record. His work continues post-election because there is still a fight going on with draconian proposed laws that have recently passed in Iowa and Georgia and are pending in 41 other states. We look forward to talking to Mark about these proposed voting restrictions today. In addition to his current work, Mark previously served as general counsel for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign and John Kerry's 2004 presidential campaign. He won four election cases in the U.S. Supreme Court, which is quite a good record, and has represented dozens of political candidates in election matters. Politico magazine named Mark as one of the 50 politicos to watch. So thank you, Mark, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Of course. And I just want to add, um, among your very impressive uh, background, Lou Dobbs also told um, the GOP to get Mark out of the way with $500 million. So uh, he also has that uh, in his background. But um, I want to start by- I did not take the $500 million. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I want to start with um, by making sure our audience is familiar with the extent of what state legislatures across the country are doing in terms of pending proposals to restrict voting. Um, could you help our audience by giving some more details about the most common features in uh, the various state bills being introduced? So first of all, thank you for, for having me. And, um, you know, there is both a commonality in theme and a commonality in execution. So the, the commonality of theme is to make voting harder, and particularly to make voting harder for um, black voters, other minorities, and young voters. Um, And that's because that that, that is the coalition that has really taken hold, really since President Obama's first election in 2008. We used to refer to this This is the Obama coalition. It's now become a more durable coalition that elects uh, Democrats more generally. And uh, and so what we see is in each state, the laws may take a slightly different form, but it's always aimed at at those coalitions. So the most common things we're seeing are cutbacks on vote by mail, uh, both uh, uh, making it harder to vote by mail, harder to get an absentee ballot uh, to begin with. Um, and then um, ways of making in-person voting more difficult, where the uh, type of inver- where the type of difficulty will pose unique challenges to um, young voters and minorities. You know, the Brennan Center, um, when, when I was just researching a little bit about some of the bills that are being introduced, they identify really just four components that make up some of the bills. And, you know, you, you touched upon a couple of them. And um, there are, you know, limiting mail and voting uh, access. There's uh, imposing stricter voter ID requirements, slashing um, voter registration opportunities and enabling more aggressive voter roll purges. Would you say those four are the main ones that you're seeing as well? Or are there more that our audience should be aware of and, and on the lookout for? So look, again, I think those are four of the, that's that's one way to categorize it. And I certainly agree with their their categorization. But for example, in, um, in, in Georgia, we saw part of their law was a, um, uh, was banning, uh, handing out water and food to people who land, stand in long lines. Well, who 
stands in long lines. Well, we know from studies of long lines in Georgia in past elections that if you were in a precinct that was 90% or more white, your average wait time at the close of polls in the primary was six minutes. Do you know what it was if you were African in a, in a precinct that was 90% or more African-American? 51 minutes. Wow. Hmm. Okay, so when you start to talk about you know, the, 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 the differential in what it means to not being able to hand out water, you're talking about the difference between people breezing in and out of polls and people waiting long line, uh, long time in lines. Similarly, in Iowa, we saw um, restrictions on uh, shortening the, the, the election day. Well, so why would you, why would you, if you were a legislature, want to shorten the number of hours that people could vote? Well, because when you cut an hour from the end of election day, you don't hit all populations equally. So I agree with those four categories, but I think I would put a, a sharper um, point on the fact that legislatures are being creative in targeting who, who they are disenfranchising. Mm-hmm. Many people have described the pending state bills and the ones that have already been passed as, like you said, targeting suppression of votes of minorities and are reminiscent of the Jim Crow era. Do you think that's an accurate description to categorize this as uh, reminiscent of the Jim Crow era? People are calling it Jim Crow 2.0. Yeah, I think, look, I think we're seeing the largest rollback of voting rights since Jim Crow. Um, The fact is that from 1965 to 2009, uh, states on average made their voting laws easier. In 2009, Barack Obama took the White House. You saw Shelby County in 2013. You saw some states uh, roll back voting rights uh, in the wake of Shelby County, um, most notably North Carolina, where they pass a bill that is, looks like what we're seeing today that was struck down after the Fourth Circuit found that it targeted African-Americans with surgical precision. Um, but we've not seen the kind of breadth of states, you know, uh, looking to roll back voting rights as extremely as they are now uh, since Jim Crow. Let's focus a little bit on the Georgia law, because that has been in the news a lot uh, recently. And it's widely denounced. President Biden said it is Jim Crow in the 21st century. And he's even now considering taking action to change the rules of filibuster to protect voters and to pass H.R. 1, which is the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. You have been fighting for fair elections and for voting rights basically your entire uh, legal career. Um, And so I want to talk more about the Georgia bill And one of the things I wanted to focus on is some of the remarks that have been made to justify passing that law. Obviously, this is done by Republicans in Georgia. Um, Governor Kemp claimed the bill makes it easier to vote and harder to cheat, and it would restore confidence in elections, even though, of course, there is no evidence that there was anything unsafe or uh, fraudulent about the last election. And so I'd love to hear, you know, your response to what is the best argument that Republicans have made for any of the restrictions they put on? And then we can talk about how you're going to answer them because we know you've gone to court. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So, look, I think to understand why the Republicans are making the arguments they are, you have to look back to the period of November 2020 to January 6th, 2021. So, you know, the argument that you laid out is more or less the argument they make, which is that they need to restore confidence. The whole harder, easier to vote, harder to achieve is is just, is nonsensical. First of all, they are not making it easier to vote. And they, the governor himself, uh, along with the Republican Secretary of State said that there was no cheating. So, so, I think that the argument they're really making that you hear them articulate to put their best foot forward is that they are trying to restore confidence. But of course, you have to ask yourself, why is there a lack of confidence, right? There wasn't a lack of confidence uh, until Donald Trump started to badmouth the elections Mm -hmm. and until uh, Republican uh, uh, legislators, state legislators, members of Congress, leadership, um, humored him at first and then joined him in the big lie. And so, you know, I don't have, I don't know who said this, but someone wrote on Twitter that there really isn't a midpoint between the fireman and the arsonist, right? You can't, you, like, you, you can't treat these, the, the argument that we somehow need to restore um, 
uh, uh, confidence as a serious argument when the reason why there is some lack of confidence is intentional on the part of the people who are now trying to make it harder to vote. Absolutely. And I think everything that I have heard is, as you said, it just is nonsensical saying it, we're making it easier when, in fact, if we look at the specific elements of what was passed, my initial impression was first it was only a couple of pages. And the one that actually passed was, what, 90 some pages and included some really um, creative ways to prevent voting and to hurt a minority community. But it seemed to me that now that I've looked at some of the things that were in the first one, it actually was even worse because it would have, for example, barred Sunday voting, which has traditionally been a day that black churches take voters to the polls. And so eliminating that, and as you were mentioning, you know, when you cut off the end of the day, it's because there are a lot of people who work nine to five, but have to travel several hours to get to their job which means they cannot vote at seven in the morning and they can't vote at five o'clock at night. And so then the polls are closed. Right. So can you address those concerns and whether the first bill was actually worse? So it's, it's really interesting, Joe, because I think what you've seen, and, and I think this is a pattern that we're going to see, is that the first round of bills that are being introduced are by the crazies, right? The message bills. <laughs> They're kind of like putting out the let's repeal all, all vote by mail. Let's, you know, you know, they put out this stuff that is just like out there, out there, out there, um, as part of a messaging effort to their um, to their base. Mm -hmm. Then I think what happened in Georgia, and I, you know, obviously they don't they don't consult me, and I think what happened in Iowa, where they also passed. Uh, an omnibus bill is that leadership thinks, okay, we'll be able to rein this back in. You know what I mean? We'll be able to, we'll let the people put out their message bills. You know how the legislative process works. You, you put out the message bills and then that sort of takes the energy out of it. The problem is that they weren't able to take the, the, the create, they were able to temper the worst aspects of those first bills, but they still had to deliver to their base a bill that was going to revenge in their words, you know, quotes um, the, you know, January, the, the, the election of Joe Biden. And let's not forget in Georgia, it was also the election of the first yeah. black senator. There's, you know, no coincidence in my view that we see this bill coming in Georgia in the way it did on the heels of Reverend Warnock's election. Yeah. Well, and taking both seats, two Democrats winning Senate seats yeah. in runoffs had to have been a motivating factor. Um, I, I, the Republicans did hold hearings, but as you just mentioned, they didn't call you to testify. They called Rudy Giuliani. And, um, you know, when I look at that, that says all that I need to know. They weren't serious about looking at, was there a problem that needed um, fixing or was it just a ridiculous thing? Um, one other thing that Republicans in Georgia said is, there's no suppression in this bill. It's just helping out because we had such a large election, we had to control this in some way. Show me the suppression, uh, a representative named Alan Powell said. So I would like to ask you to talk about the things that are suppressive and some that might not seem directly suppressive, but like taking away Raffenberger's, the secretary of state's powers and even the powers of local election boards, which aren't necessarily targeting the voter, but end up counting uh, against how things are counted. Yeah. So that's such a good and important point and such a good and important question, because I think in the public's mind, sometimes, and I, I bet you're going to tell me this is true across all areas of law, the public wants the smoking gun, <laughs> right? They want that one thing, right? They want that one provision that says, aha, here is the provision that says, you know, they want the provision entitled Voter Suppression Act of 2021, <laughs> when in fact, laws are more complicated than that. They are comprised of a large number of provisions that all, what I say, is cut the same way. And when you stack them up, 
they have a cumulative effect that any one of them might not in and of itself be. So mm -hmm. I mentioned, you know, one of the things people talk about all the time is voter ID laws. And they say, yeah, but you know, what's wrong with voter ID laws? And I always say, look, setting aside for a second the, disenfranch the direct disenfranchisement of voter ID laws, when you ask, when you make, when you add a step to the check-in process in a state, you are going to slow down voting. Like you may just slow down voting by 10 or 15 seconds, but if you slow down voting by 10 or 15 seconds per person, and you have also um, had other problems with long lines, you're going to create, um, you're going to, you're going to exacerbate that. But in Georgia, you know, we, you mentioned the taking away of the authority of the, um, the ability of the uh, election board now, the composition of it to be controlled more closely by the legislature. Um, that is a form of voter suppression that could trump all others, to use a bad word, because it, it potentially <laughs> no gives- No pun intended. No yeah. pun intended. Um, you know, because it allows state legislatures that frankly showed irresponsible behavior in many instances at the end of 2020, to be able to act more directly on those irresponsible impulses. So this was a bad bill. Um, this is a bill that is targeted at black voters, other minority voters and young voters. And it's also, as you point out, an anti-democracy bill. Yeah. Well, it, you've mentioned the voter ID requirements being increased and that making the lines even longer by just even 15 seconds per voter limitation. But when you add to that, that you've cut down the early voting period, right. You have eliminated a lot of the vote by mail. You've restricted where there are drop boxes and the times. You can only drop off during a time when the place of voting is opened, which means it's during the time people are working. So when you combine all of those, you have to say that that is more suppressive. Right. Um, did any Democrats and, vote for it? And just uh, just just to just to pick up on that for a second. So mm -hmm. let's go back to my my premise. African Americans wait online fifty one minutes. Whites wait online six minutes. Now you've just decreased early voting. What have you done? Well, you've pushed some number of people into voting election day. Right. You've you've increased the you've decreased the size of the number or the the mm -hmm. breadth of opportunities to vote. So you're gonna you're gonna increase lines. You mentioned fewer drop boxes. So some people are not going to trust the mail because they distrust the mail for understandable reasons. So what's that going to do? That's going to increase in-person voting and increase lines. So this is what I mean about the interplay of these things. Right. It's not mm -hmm. any one of these individually. It is the fact that when you cut or days of early voting and you make absentee ballot applications harder to get, you're going to have a um, an exponential a multiplier effect between and among these provisions. So were there any Democrats who voted for this? No. No, not a surprise. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So Stacey Abrams had tweeted just before the bill passed that she predicted that it was going to pass fast, fast in order to avoid actual analysis and public awareness of how it hurts voters of color, increases taxes on struggling families, and steals power from local governments. And you replied, you promised an immediate lawsuit, which you have lived up to your promise. So can you tell us a little bit more about that um, in Georgia and what your plans are in other states that are still having these pending, Arizona um, and several other states? Yeah, so um, you're right about the Georgia speed. I mean, Georgia, after after days and days and weeks of deliberation, they decided on a single day that it had to pass the House, the Senate, and be signed by the governor. <laughs> so within a matter of a few hours, the whole bill um, uh, took shape and was signed um, with the governor under the picture of a plantation. All of that in one day. Um, that press conference in which he signed it was about 6.30. We filed our lawsuit in federal court by 10.30 that evening. Wow. Um, uh, in in Iowa, when they had passed their law, uh, the governor signed it at about 8 p.m. at night. We filed a lawsuit the following morning at, at, um, at 8 a.m. So what I've, what I've told, what I've said publicly and promised to these, suppress, these vote suppressors who passed these laws, if you pass these laws, you will be sued and you will be sued fast. 
and we will aggressively litigate to protect the rights of voters. So in Georgia, we represent the New Georgia Project, an African-American um, voter registration uh, uh, organization. We represent Black Voters Matter, and we represent RISE, which is a, uh, a student uh, group. And our claims are um, that the law violates Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act in that it discriminates against Black voters uh, and uh, also um, uh, violations of the, um, the U.S. Constitution, the, the right to vote, um, because these provisions are not justified uh, by any state interest uh, and pose a severe burden on voters. I want to circle into um, one U.S. Supreme Court case that we heard um, a few weeks ago, uh, Arizona Republican Party versus DNC and uh, Bravanovich versus DNC. And those cases, just for our audience, raised two issues. Uh, first, whether Arizona voting restrictions violated Section 2 um, of the Voting Rights Act, which is something that you just mentioned. And that section prohibits uh, laws that discriminate on the basis of race. And then the second issue is whether Arizona's ballot harvesting ban was implemented with discriminatory intent. Um, Michael Carvin, who represented the uh, Arizona Republican Party in the case against um, Arizona Attorney General Bravanovich, argued that the law didn't violate Section 2 of um, the Voting Rights Act because it was a mere regulation on uh, time, place, and manner of voting and didn't prevent anyone from voting, but simply just changed the um, time, place, and manner of voting. Um, how much water does his legal argument hold, um, in, in, especially just in the court? Yeah. So first of all, just one clarification. Um, Carvin was representing the Republican Party on the same side as Bronovich. Bronovich is the mm -hmm. Republican Attorney General of Arizona. I, I actually brought that lawsuit. My partner argued in this, argued in the Supreme Court, but that's a case I'm I'm very familiar with. Um, the the you know Carvin, you know, who is an experienced lawyer, kind of gave away the store uh, in one of his questions, in one of his answers to Justice uh, Barrett, in which she asked, you know. How is the how is the Republican Party harmed? How do you have standing? What's your injury in this case? Um, and he said, "Well, you know, essentially, he said politics is a zero sum game, and so if these voters are able to vote, we're injured." And that's really, if you think about it, an extraordinary admission. That's the kind of thing that you know Michael Kinsley, if a number of years ago, would have referred to as a Washington as a gaffe, which is when someone in Washington accidentally tells the truth. Um, but he said it, he said the quiet part out loud and, you know, the Republican Party has sort of stood by it. Um, I don't think their legal argument, obviously, I don't think their legal argument is correct. And I would encourage people who are on the fence about this to go read the facts. You know, sometimes we get very disconnected from the facts. So here are the facts. You know, you said you put it exactly right in legal terms that they found intentional discrimination. What does that mean? What that means is that the Arizona legislature was concerned that Latinos were gaining voting strength. And they wanted to stop it. So they put together a plan to stop it that included promoting a racist video of a Latino man who was engaged in perfectly lawful conduct, but they used it to try to appeal to the, to the, to poor motive, to, to racial motives in the legislature to pass a law that was aimed at harming Latino and native American voters. Okay. That's what, that's what the facts are. The facts are that they had introduced this bill before Shelby County. And when DOJ indicated they might not pre-clear it because it would have a negative impact on uh, minority voting, they withdrew it and then only reintroduced it after Shelby County came down. So it, Wait, well, sometimes very Let's, easy let to us, get... Can you just, yeah. one or two sentences, so that our audience knows the um, problem that was raised in Shelby County, the result of it? Sure. So Shelby County was a case, um, it used to be that um, under a different provision of the Voting Rights Act um, uh, called Section 5, that if a state that was covered due to its historic uh, discriminatory practices made changes in voting laws, it had to submit those changes in the law to the Department of Justice for what was referred to as preclearance. The idea was that if you were a state or a, or a locality that engaged in racial um, discriminatory voting uh, laws in the past, before you pass new ones uh, or change them, 
DOJ needed to sign off on them or else a district court in Washington, D.C. did. Um, that was struck down uh, in a case called Shelby County versus Holder, um, uh, where the court found that the uh, prevalence of racial discrimination in those covered jurisdictions had largely mitigated. Uh, those covered jurisdictions were mostly in the South, um, and that therefore the, the, the singling out of these Southern states and jurisdictions was unfair to them. Thank I will, you. I will leave that as. Yes, that's fine. I just thought to understand the rest of what you were going to say, it would help. Yeah. So what I was saying is that they proposed this law. It was struck down. It was going to be not pre-cleared by the Department of Justice. They waited till after the court struck down the pre-clearance requirement and then passed it. I want to circle back to uh, the, the quote that you mentioned with Carvin. And that was, like you said, just such a, a admission. And do you think that his saying that politics is a zero-sum game, and so that's why they're passing these laws, do you think that this is proof that this bill was passed because Republicans think they cannot win without these restrictions in politics? Oh, I don't think there's any question that Republicans think they can't win without these restrictions in politics. Um, you know, if you if you think about this and and you're you are the youngest delegate for Joe Biden, so this will feel a little this will hit you differently than it will hit uh, Jill and I. But you know, when when George Bush won the presidency and lost the popular vote, that was a really big deal. I mean, it was a big deal because of the recount and everything, but it was psychologically a very big deal for the country mm -hmm. and for the Republican Party, so much so that George Bush then told his 2004 campaign to make sure that they um, competed in some blue states to increase their popular vote, because, because it was understood that candidates wanted to rule with a mandate of the majority. There was a strong majoritarian impulse in American politics. Um, in 2016, Donald Trump lost by 5 million votes and Republicans gave up the idea of winning elections through majorities. So in 2020, when Joe Biden won by 7 million votes, that wasn't even a point of embarrassment for the Republican Party. Um, right now, we have a Republican Party that lost by 7 million votes at the presidential level and yet contested the outcome of the election. Look at the Senate. Look at the Senate. How many more people have voted for Democrats for Senate than Republicans? And yet it's 50-50. Look at the House. How many, you know what it is in the House? It's even more than it is in the Senate. I'm sorry, less than it is in the Senate. It's more than it is in the presidency, right? More de more people have voted for Democrats than Republicans, yet the margin is, is razor thin. Look at state legislatures, right? Look at governors. Republicans don't actually win a majority of any category of election in this country. They have ceased to try to be a majority. So yes, Michael Carvin was speaking to what is the demographic problem that Republicans have, which is that they need to find ever increasingly clever ways to use the rules to prevent a true majoritarian system. So Victor, maybe um, do you have handy a, a video oh. or a audio of what Carvin said. Yeah. But while you're getting that lined up, I wanted to just add to something, Mark, that you said, which is it's a 50-50 Senate, but the 50 Democratic senators represent 70% of Americans. There you are. Right. And the other 50 right. senators who are Republican represent 30%. Right. So that is just not fair. That's where we get into a whole nother discussion about the Electoral College yeah. and whether this is right, fair. But, uh, right. But you, re but you remember, well, you remember as well as I do that there was a time when it was important to both parties yeah. to feel like they were a majority of the country. Yes. I mean, could you imagine Ronald Reagan campaigning on the, on the platform that he would lose the popular vote? <laughs> Right. I mean, it's just it's such a far cry from where the Republican Party is today. Absolutely. You are completely correct. And yeah. it's a bad situation. Yeah. But, yeah. And I think we can show that in this clip, just just what Carvin said. And organization 
elections to educate their voters and because the policy harmed its members who would have voted out of precinct. What's the interest of the Arizona RNC here in keeping, say, the out of uh, precinct um, voter dis ballot disqualification rules on the books? Because it puts us at a competitive disadvantage relative to Democrats. Politics is a zero-sum game. And every uh, extra vote they get through unlawful interpretations of Section 2 hurts us. It's the difference between winning an election 50 to 49 and losing okay, an election thank you. 50 to 49. Um, I think the the funniest part in, in that is just that Amy Coney Barrett was the one who asked the question, and then when uh, Carvin started to answer, she then kind of was like, "My time is up." But it's just, I mean, the, the the answer is like you said, is just this admission that you know they're they're trying to hold on to power. And he referred to you know the Section Two part, which is uh, the discriminatory intent, and he also relied on you know uh, defending his argument because it was just time, place, and manner um, restrictions. And I'm I'm curious whether you think because to me it seems like this argument ignores some of the specifics of changing. Um, you know, laws like barring Sunday voting and preventing voting, uh, voting after 5 p.m., which clearly has this disparate impact on certain groups of voters. Are you seeing or do you think that other states will use the same kind of defense for their suppressive bills? Yeah, look, I expect that we will see Republican attorneys general, um, uh, secretaries of state, perhaps interveners by Republican organizations use every um, legal argument that they think is available to them. Um, you know, time, place, and manner restrictions or time, time, time place, and manner um, uh, 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 provisions have never been viewed or acknowledged by the courts to be a defense against a violation of the First and Fourteenth Amendment. Um, they clearly yield to the Voting Rights Act because Congress has given the uh, the rest of the time, place, and manner clause of the Constitution gives Congress the authority to override the state's choice of time, place, and manner. So we have a uniform election day because Congress has overridden the time, place, and manner choices of states. Um, so section the section two claim is obvi obviously trumps it, but we've never seen a court say that time, place, and manner restriction immunizes otherwise unconstitutional voting restrictions. But again, you know, I expect they'll make every argument they can. For our audience, just with this case specifically, just to wrap this case up, how do you expect the Supreme Court to decide these two cases? And what would it mean if they allow these laws to stand? So, you know, the first is I I have a rule against trying to predict what the Supreme Court or any court's <laughs> going to do. I will say that I thought that, for example, in that quote, you saw the justices, including Justice Barrett, including uh, Justice Kavanaugh, the chief, uh, express some skepticism in their questioning of the other side. There were also hard questions at our side. So, you know, who knows, particularly with this new format of where they do, where this these arguments are being done telephonically, you know, it's it's really hard to read much into the questions. I expect we'll get a decision by the end of June, at the end of the, by the end of the term. And um, the court can, you know, is going to have to rule on a, difficult question of, I don't think it should be a hard question, but an important question of how Section 2 applies against a backdrop of states like Georgia taking the actions they are. So what I'm hopeful is that the court will, um, will you know, not avert its eyes from what is otherwise happening in the country. Oops, that's sorry. not mine. <laughs> mine. Usually my dog. Um, I was going to say. <laughs> it's not. Okay. So let's, let's turn to the HR1, which is the federal bill uh, that might help control the Georgia bill and other state bills. It would protect voting rights in federal elections. And it is often thought to be the landmark democracy bill of our time. So let's talk about this bill particularly. And also whether it actually does control anything in terms of state elections. Could a state do the kinds of things they're doing now in elections for the governor, elections for state yeah. members of their legislatures? It's a, it's, a really, it's a really interesting question and one that, um, you know, has gotten some attention, but not probably as much oh. as it should. So clearly Congress has the authority under the time, place, and manner clause, what we were just talking about, uh, to override state decisions and to establish the time, place, and manner of 
of, of federal congressional elections. So, so that part, I think, is relatively straightforward. That's the reason, as I said, why we have a uniform election day and states can't challenge that. It's the reason why we have um, uh, why we have voter voter, uh, you know, which you know, was the bill that was passed about registering a, a, a driver's license. It's why we have a uniform bill for absentee ballots that go to military people. Right. So that's pretty straightforward. The question of what about state elections? Well, historically, states that have elections on the same day as federal elections, in other words, where they choose their state officials on the same day as they choose federal officials, have adopted a uniform set of of requirements because it's kind of impractical to hold two elections on the same day. Um, I, I would argue that the that the that Congress is Congress's power to pass this law, not just under the time, place, and manner clause, but under the um, section five of the fifteenth of the of the thirteenth. I'm sorry, of the fourteenth amendment. Section five of the fourteenth amendment gives Congress the ability to regulate the state election pieces as well. But there's definitely um, a, a, a there's room for argument there, and it would be a terrible thing for democracy if all of a sudden you saw states starting to bifurcate their registration systems, bifurcate their ballots, so that there'd be a federal ballot and then a state ballot, and you'd have different rules for each. Wow. Terrible. Um, uh, now, filibuster is coming up now as something that could prevent HR one from becoming law. And I'm wondering if you think that there is a likelihood that this bill can pass the Senate without changing or eliminating the filibuster rules. No. Wow. Okay. I mean, so, I, honestly, you think there are ten Republicans who are going to vote yeah. for who are going to vote for this? Um, you know, I'll tell you what. <laughs> name three. <laughs> Uh, it's hard. <laughs> I am Pollyanna. There's no question that okay, I'm all well, optimistic. I hope you're right. I, I hope. I remember bipartisanship. I remember compromise. But so at this point, I have to say, I have reached the conclusion that the filibuster serves no legitimate purpose. It does not protect minority rights. And what it does is it kills majority rights. We are a majority election democracy, but the majority cannot pass any laws. It is a minority that can stop it. So I don't know if you agree, but it, what's your opinion of either abolishing or amending the filibuster? So here is my take on it. With respect to voting, okay, which is kind of my, my area, um, it is a perverse outcome to allow a minority of elected officials who are themselves elected by a minority of the population. Right. I mean, your statistic about 70% of the, what is it? What did you say? 70%? 50, 50 senators represent 70% of voters and the other 50 represent 30. Right. So we're now talking about like a, a minority of minor, that are elected by a very deep minority, right? Um, or very, you know, very uh, low minority. Um, so, in the area of voting, I, I think that there is no um, uh, there is no question that the filibuster should not be allowed to thwart the outcome of of pro voting legislation, whether that is done through, you know a mechanism that is unique to voting, whether it's done through a reform or a repeal, I don't really know. Um, I've never actually worked on Capitol Hill. Um, I just know that we, that you can't turn, you can't turn minority rights in the Senate into a, um, you know, into the death warrant of democracy. In addition to H.R. 1, President Biden and Congress have also been making an effort to restore the Voting Rights Act that was gutted in Shelby, which a case we just discussed. Um, do you think that there is a way to solve the problem raised by Shelby, which was to say, OK, everything's fine now. We, you know, sh this worked. We don't have to pre-clear things. And now we're having to, after they pass try and take down laws. Is there something we could do along that line? I do. Um, I think that, you know, if you take 
the Chief Justice and the court in Shelby at its word. It was not the preclearance requirement itself that was unconstitutional. It was simply the coverage formula, the way by which the states and localities were chosen that was the problem. They believed that it reflected um, an outdated view of the South. Mm. Um, so I think that it is you know, relatively simple from a constitutional standpoint for Congress to pass a new coverage formula that take that does not start from the 1965, you know, the the state of play in 1965 and then update it, but rather starts with a you know a look at current conditions on the ground, um, and uh, then imposes a a um, uh, a coverage formula based on that. So I do think it's possible. Okay, so it could be that this Georgia law could be the new standard of okay, you did it. You're showing us exactly that the South hasn't changed, and so we have to go back to uh, covering these states. But um, Victor, why don't you talk a little bit about Democracy Docket? Yeah, so with everything going on right now, um, I think it's important for our audience to know about your organization, uh, Democracy Docket, which is um, a website and organization that you founded to defend the right to vote through advocacy, uh, education, and litigation. And I also learned that Democracy Docket is sponsored by uh, the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, uh, the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, and other uh, Democratic Party groups. Do you also raise funds from citizens, or is it mainly those groups that are um, sponsoring your work. Yeah. So I just to clarify, the Democratic Party doesn't financially sponsor Democracy Docket. Um, it um, they they are we feature them as organizations that do um, important litigation in this space. And so we we think of them as sponsors in that sense, but they're not mm -hmm. they're not they're not um, sponsors of the of the site or of the organization. Sure. Um, you know, the Democracy Docket itself um, is our goal is to educate people and make them smarter consumers and understanding of, of um, voting, uh, voter suppression, uh, gerrymandering and the like, and also to be a place where they can find ways to be involved in advocacy. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it does, it does raise money on the site from, from, from individuals, um, but it is not formally affiliated with the Democratic Party in that way. In addition to litigation, Democracy Docket tracks hundreds of election related cases and how how big is your team to do this are do you have pro bono lawyers helping or how is this operation being run because it is you know with the number of bills being introduced this is this can't just be a one person effort i'm assuming yeah no it's not a one person effort and it's really interesting cuz democracy docket began as um i thought wouldn't it be cool if there was a place i could post my thoughts on on democracy and voter suppression um, other people's thoughts on democracy and voter suppression. And then along the way, reporters would call and say, hey, where can I find a copy of this case? Where can I find a copy of this bill? So slowly at first, I was like, okay, we'll just, you know what? We'll also post these things online. Well, it turns out that that actually turned out to be the most popular and sought after um, function of the organization, which is that we track and and make publicly available um, all of these case materials, statutes and the like. So, you know, at this point, it's a it's a team of, I think, six people. It's growing. We're going to continue. We're continuing to hire um, because the 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 demand has increased and the volume has in, you know as you see around the country has increased but it's but but you know it, it is probably a commentary on your generation that um that the real utility that democracy docket serves for so many people is being able for people to read the source materials themselves. Mm -hmm. They're happy to read the newsletters, but they want to be able to link through to the underlying documents. They're happy to read my take on a case, but they want to be able to hear the argument or read the transcript or read the opinion or read the briefs themselves. And that is not something as a Gen Xer I anticipated, <laughs> uh, but it's really turned out to be what a lot of what drives a lot of the interest. For sure. And you know, the work that you're doing is so incredibly important important. And, you know, where do you see democracy going in the short and the long term? Um, and, and kind of, is there any way for our audience to help Democracy Docket? Yeah, so Democracy Docket is growing, um, like I said, by leaps and bounds. Um, 
you know, our newsletter, which began with me, frankly, sending emails <laughs> before the newsletter is literally, I would send emails to a few dozen people. Um, you know, uh, it had, uh, it had fewer than 2000 subscribers when I launched it formally as a newsletter in March of 2020. It now has 80,000, uh, wow. subscribers. Um, it was quarterly now it's weekly and it's going more often. So, so, the things people can do to help um, help the organization is number one, first, check out the site, leave feedback, tell us we're going to be doing a major revamp and, and relaunch of the site to make it to make uh, more functionality on it. Um, and also leave your ideas for 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 laws that you think need to be challenged. You know, it's hard or if there's a bad bill out there and we don't know about it, we may just not know about it. So we try to, you know, we try to um, uh, get input of ideas. We're right now in the middle of what we call our 100 Days of Democracy, where we're actually soliciting ideas from the public as to what voting law changes do you think Congress should include? And I've been promoting those, um, and hopefully we'll see some of those as part of reform efforts. And then finally, you can follow Democracy Docket on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and um, on YouTube. It seems like Democracy Docket is getting even more creative in the solutions to combat the voter suppression laws than Republicans are in their creative solutions to suppress the voting laws. But it's, it's is truly, goal. yes, exactly. Yeah. And I, I want to stress something you just said, which is the importance of clicking through to the original yeah. document, because so many people take the, uh, the statement of facts as presented in a newspaper. So when I read someone was indicted or that a lawsuit was filed, I don't just take the summary in the paragraph. I click through when you read it online, it's easy to do. And Democracy Docket makes it easy to do. I click through and I actually read the document. That means that I can form my own opinion. I can be informed by experts who comment on it. But it also is true that I then know the exact words that are at issue. And it's a really important thing in a democracy for the voters to be fully informed. And so I, I really, I, I can't believe there's only 80,000. There should be hundreds of thousands of people. Um, as many as follow you should also be subscribers to Democracy Docket. It's a terrific source of information. So let's just maybe close our discussion today and hope that you'll come back because I think you're Anytime. a great guest and we'd love to talk more about who knows what. Um, but just let's end by talking about, this is something Victor usually asks. He, he always wants to know what can his generation do to help strengthen democracy at both the state and local level, as well as the federal level. And I also want to, for my generation, uh, uh, those of us who have become lawyers, um, how can lawyers get involved in, in this effort? Yeah. So, you know, the question I get more than any is what can I do, right? What can I do? And what I say is that the most important thing you can do is also in some sense the hardest. And it is the thing that frankly, both of you have done. And I see you jail on TV do all the time, which is you can speak out. You know, it's, it's easy to lament the Georgia law, but it's hard to say to your friends, your relatives, your customers, your clients, your bosses, your, you know, your, your colleagues, that it's not right and it's not fair. It's easier not to have the conversation. It's easier to just go about your day and say, you know what, it doesn't affect me. But if everyone stood up in the town square and spoke out. Now, for some people in the town square, Jill, you're going to be on TV. Your town square is going to be really big. And for other people, their town square may just be their social media. It may just be their 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 Easter dinner table. Um, but they but it's important that people at this time, when democracy is under attack, not just turn a blind eye to it and let it be okay. Yeah. Say to people, it's not okay. Yeah, you know, President Obama, right after he finished his second term spoke at the Chicago Economic Club. And that was one of the questions he was asked is, what can I do? What can people do? And he said, be informed. So read Democracy Docket. Be involved and vote. And nothing says vote and protect 
fair voting rules more than Mark Elias. So yeah. we are thrilled to have him with us. And we thank your law firm for having you be this expert that you are. And um, we hope our audience has enjoyed this and we'll look forward to having you back again. I'd, be, I'd love to come back. Thank you Thank so you. much.